A reading from 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 16. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office, the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Women, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is God's word. If you're just joining us, we've been making our way through the letter of 1 Timothy, which is on page 992 in a Bible and a chair back near you. And 1 Timothy is basically God saying to us, let me help you create a social ecosystem in which my life and my love and my protection are real. Our verses today deal with two official roles in this social ecosystem called church. And we might begin, therefore, by defining what we mean by the word church. It's not obvious. Our English word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, a common word in the ancient Roman world. If you were a normal first century Roman and someone invited you to church, you would not have assumed that they were inviting you to a Christian gathering. You would likely have assumed that they were inviting you to an assembly having to do with your citizenship. We see this common use of the word church in the book of Acts in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19, we're told that Paul's preaching of the gospel in Ephesus angered local idol makers people who earned a living making and selling idols of the goddess Artemis. The angry tradesmen led by a man called Demetrius stirred up a mob to protest Paul and the Christians. The protest came dangerously close to a riot. That is, until the town clerk stood up and quieted the mob with these words. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. And there are proconsuls. Let them bring the charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. The word translated assembly there is our word for church, ecclesia. In other words, the word church does not describe a mob of people gathered randomly in common cause, but an official sanctioned, regular gathering of the state in the ancient world. And we cannot help but wonder whether in choosing this word ecclesia to describe itself, the early Christians were signaling their allegiance to a higher, more official authority than that of Rome. 
a normal church filled with normal Christians gathering regularly is more radical than we tend to think. Just ask the many evangelical Christians gathered today in communist countries. In the Bible, there are at least three senses of the word church that are used to describe the people of God, people who hope in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to list them now from larger to smaller. First, the word church sometimes refers to everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, regardless of their proximity to one another. This is the sense of the word church in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, which says that God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church here is the church as only God sees it, comprised of all who hope in Jesus on earth and in heaven. This is sometimes called the church universal. Secondly, the word church is used to describe all who trust in Jesus in a particular region or city. For instance, in the book of Acts, we read the church, singular, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Using this sense of the word church, we can rightly speak of the church in Nashville or the church in Tennessee or even the church in America. We can't all fit under one roof, of course, but our cultural and geographical connection makes cooperation possible. For instance, the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church in Rome, knowing full well that Rome was made up of many house churches. However, Paul assumes the cooperation of the churches in Rome so that he needs only to write one letter. This is the church regional. Thirdly, the word church is used in the Bible to describe groups of Christians who, one, meet regularly under the same roof, two, commit to a shared life together, and three, submit together to God's authority exercised through church leaders. This is the sense of the word church in Colossians 4.15, which says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. The first century was, the first century Christian movement was essentially a house church movement and it remained so until Christians gained the freedom and ability to build larger spaces of their own. Interestingly, many of those spaces which are still standing today are built on top of the ancient Roman homes in which they first began. So the church universal, the church regional, and the church local. Three dimensions of the word church in the Bible. Now throughout history, Christians have tried to reflect these three dimensions organizationally. And we have come to different conclusions, as you may know. Some place the emphasis on the church universal, devising a complex hierarchy of offices ranging from popes to cardinals to archbishops to bishops to priests to deacons to laity. Others emphasize the church local, seeking to reflect the twofold office of elders and deacons who are called from within the church. That's how we organize ourselves here at Emmanuel Nashville. But I hasten to add that if the Bible is to be our final authority, we must allow for flexibility in church organization. Every mainline denomination is to some degree reading both from and between the lines of Scripture when it comes to organization. But does that mean we are free to organize ourselves in just whatever way we want? No. The church, we are told in verse 15 of our text, is not a trivial assembly that we can reinvent at will. It is the household of the living God. And like every healthy household, it has an ecosystem. We considered some of the dimensions of that ecosystem 
two weeks ago when we looked at the complementary roles of men and women in the church. Today we consider another dimension of that social ecosystem, that of healthy church leadership. And as with our text two weeks ago, to understand what's happening here, we need to remember that the church in the first century was a profoundly liberating experience. When Jesus threw open the door to the family of God by his death on the cross for sins, welcoming every nationality and every class and gender to sit at God's table, there was so much freedom, so much liberation that hardly anyone knew what to do with themselves. A whole new world opened up. And they didn't have long to figure out how it worked. A mere 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, 3,000 souls were added to the church. Shortly thereafter, another 5,000 were added, which means that from the very start, the 12 apostles, most of whom were common tradesmen, none of whom were statesmen, had a massive job of organization on their hands. And it wasn't long before problems began to emerge. In Acts chapter 6, we read this. When the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenist, the Greek Christians, arose against the Hebrews. I find it strangely comforting that the apostles fielded complaints. <laughs> Not that you ever complain. Because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. That is the distribution of food. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said to them, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers and sisters, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now what we see here in Acts is the emergence of two leadership offices in the church. One office focused on the spiritual needs of the church and the other on the physical needs of the church. Because God is creating a, a social ecosystem which ministers to the whole person. And it's these two offices that are reflected in our text today in the categories of overseers and deacons. Now, overseers uh, um, are also referred to as elders and shepherds or pastors, and they generally attend to the spiritual needs of the church, while deacons, which is uh, the word deacon is a word that simply means servant, generally attend to the physical needs of the church, and both offices are vital. And I believe that God is calling many of us today to pursue one of these two offices. I believe that because we need more elders and deacons. And wherever we discover need, God can be trusted to provide. And so, like usual, I have a prayer and a goal in this sermon, and it's not hidden. I want to sign up 100 people for an elder deacon interest meeting. A hundred people who are interested in the office of elder or deacon. The meeting is scheduled for March 3rd and Barnabas will tell you a little bit more about it later on. And from there, you can decide if God is leading you to apply for the training. Now, you might be wondering, what if I'm not called to be an overseer of a deacon or a deacon? Uh, why should I care about this sermon? The answer is, because this is a household. And we all have an interest in its flourishing. Elders and deacons are chosen from within the church by the church. So it's vital that we all know who should be set apart for the work. If we don't know what an elder or a deacon looks like, here is what is likely to happen. We are likely to select our elders and deacons based on the leadership criteria of the culture and not the Bible. And wherever that happens, churches tend to become cold, calculating corporations. 
And isn't it striking that nearly all of the qualifications for elders and deacons have to do with their character, and not with their intellect or their achievements? Can an elder or a deacon be the leader of a major corporation? Of course. Some of ours have been. Do elders and deacons need to have leadership abilities? Yes. But that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is calling and character. Do we desire the office for the right reasons? And are we qualified for it in the eyes of God? I hope to make it easy for us to understand and to answer that question today. So what I'm planning to do here is to just take these two offices as they're given to us here in Scripture. First overseers, then deacons, given uh, beginning first with verses 1 to 7. Notice verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task or a noble work. Now, the words overseer, elder, and shepherd, as I've said, are interchangeable in the New Testament. And here at Emmanuel, we make an artificial distinction between pastors and elders just for the sake of organizational clarity. But we know from the Bible that pastors and elders and shepherds are, 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 and overseers are given to the same task, the work of soul care. And that work, says Paul, is noble work. But we might begin by asking, why does Paul feel the need to say that the work of an elder is noble work? And the most reasonable answer to that question is that it didn't look like noble work. Listen to the way that Paul describes his own work as an elder in Acts chapter 20. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, now here's Paul describing his work as an elder. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and, mark this, with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If we could put the office of elder completely into a job description, there's not an HR department on earth that would approve it. That's why there's not enough money on earth to buy an overseer like Paul. Only God can call a man to such all-consuming work, and only God can sustain a man in such a work. Although it appears to be a lowly work, a kind of tireless plodding in the same direction, the work of an elder is noble. Therefore, a man must never undertake the work half-heartedly. Notice verse 1. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Aspire and desire mean that he's reaching out for the office on the inside. His whole heart and being are set on it. The great English preacher Charles Spurgeon once quipped that if a man can do something other than pastor, he should do that. Paul would agree. Pastors and elders who no longer desire to be pastors should not be. 
it is a work so sacred, it can only be undertaken with a wholehearted desire. I was in a meeting last year with a group of Acts 29 network pastors, fantastic group of men. Pastor Matt Chandler of the Village Church in Dallas was there. I rarely call out still living pastors by name. Always feels kind of risky. But I feel that I can make an exception here. Uh, Toward the end of the meeting as Matt hurried to another pastoral commitment, he said this on his way out of the door. I cannot even believe that I get to be a pastor. Who am I to enjoy such an honor? I love that way of thinking. That's the heart of an elder. I know of another pastor among us who will remain nameless. Last year he had um, the chance, he was chosen to receive a coveted ticket to a White House gala dinner. And he had to choose between that or teaching at church the next day. He chose church. And he chose the nobler part. What an honor to be a teacher of the Word of God. Who are we to receive it? But if God has put it in our heart and the people of God have set us apart to it, Who were we to refuse it? In 2014, that desire was in my heart. And I, like you, um, received the invitation to put myself forward as an elder. And I balked. And a dear brother, Tony Shepard, who might be in the room right now, I'm not sure, took me aside and said to me, TJ, the men look at you as an elder. If you don't put yourself forward to be an elder, you will diminish the office of elder in their eyes. Now that took guts. And he was absolutely right. And here I am, the pastor of this church. You just never know what's going to happen. It can happen to you. Because the work of an elder is noble work, desire alone is not enough to commend a man for it. There's a high, but not impossible, standard to be met for those who desire the work. Notice verse two. An overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. We don't have time to look at each one of these, but I want to single out four quickly, rapid fire. Number one, above reproach. Above reproach doesn't mean everyone has good things to say about him. Not everyone had good things to say about Jesus. Above reproach means that his life is a testament to the sincerity of his faith in Jesus. Hardly anyone makes it through this life without being accused of some wrong. The question is, one, whether the accusation is true. And two, how we respond to the accusation, if it is or if it isn't true. When someone is above reproach, we see their name on the ballot for elder and we think to ourselves, of course, I can totally see that. The second thing is this, the husband of one wife. Uh, This phrase literally translates a one woman man. This does not necessarily exclude divorce men from the office of overseer, just as it does not necessarily exclude single men from the office of overseer. This qualification is here to exclude men with more than one wife and men who wish they had more than one wife. The third thing is this, able to teach. And this is perhaps the qualification which most distinguishes the office of elder from the office of deacon. Um, The way that this qualification is worded, though, is very telling. We know from chapter 5 of this letter that Paul expects there to be some elders who excel in preaching and teaching. But that's not all elders. All elders should be able to teach. Notice the word able. Should be able 
to teach gospel doctrine. But not all elders excel at teaching and preaching, and that's God's good design. We should remember who it is that gives these gifts to the church. The Holy Spirit distributes gifts as he sees fit. And it takes all kinds of elders to pastor a healthy church. Number four, not violent but gentle. The word violent here could also be translated bully. Not a bully. And the word gentle could be translated yielding. Does that mean that elders are pushovers? Not at all. It means, as Paul puts it elsewhere, that they do not insist on their own way. I think this is the most striking feature of an elder, and I'll show you why in just a second, by connecting three dots in 1 Timothy up to this point. The first dot is this one, chapter 1 and verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge, that's a strong word, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare charge warfare chapter 3 and verse 2 therefore an overseer must be not violent but gentle the charge of an elder is spiritual warfare waged in gentleness and the most obvious way of discovering such men is by observing their households. Notice verse four and five. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Because the church is God's household, the best way to tell if a man is suited to manage it is to observe how he manages his own. And here are some probing questions to that end. Does his wife feel secure in his affections? Or is she walking on eggshells, trying not to set him off? Is he a stabilizing spiritual force in his home? Or is he just a neutral force, not really moving the needle toward faith in God at all? Does he lead the way in prayer and the enjoyment of God's word? Or is he counting on those around him to just kind of pick it up along the way? Do the people in his house know that he enjoys God? Do his children living under his roof respect and obey him? I don't mean here that his children obey him because they're afraid of him. That's bullying, not parenting. Rather, do they want to please him because they admire him? Perhaps the key word wrapping all this up is the word care there in verse 5. How will he care for God's church? The word care implies attentiveness. If a man is not attentive to the needs of his household, he will not be attentive in the right way to the needs of God's household. Now, does this mean that a man must have a wife and kids to qualify as an elder? No. The Apostle Paul, like the Lord Jesus in the final years of his life here on earth, lived on the road, having no wife or kids, bouncing from place to place with an ever-changing group of companions, working with his hands for the necessities of his friends and for himself. The point here is that every elder qualified man is a man taking responsibility for the people around him. An elder doesn't say, it's your job to adjust to my leadership. An elder studies the people around him, asking the question, how can I make this work for you? And in this way, he is a man after God's own heart. 
Listen to these words from Jesus in Matthew chapter 20, which describe how this kind of man comes into existence. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. No one is more an elder, more an overseer, more a pastor than Jesus. He's the great shepherd of the sheep, says the apostle Peter. And only Jesus can create elders after his own heart. The heart of an elder grows from the soil of the gospel out of love for Christ who gave himself. And there's so much more, of course, that we could say here, but we have to move on. The second office, deacons. Notice verses 8 to 13. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified. Not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. The office of deacon is distinguished by its emphasis on the physical needs of the church, including financial needs and mercy needs and social needs and so many more. Uh, Deacons help the elders in their work of oversight, and for that reason, it would be nearly impossible to give a complete list of diaconal responsibilities for the simple reason that deacons are just doing everything that's not teaching and preaching and spiritual oversight. And all the deacons in the room should say amen. It's a lot. And because of this widespread influence, The qualifications for deacons are high. There must be a consistency between their lives and their confession. They must not be flippant. That's the sense of the word dignified here. They must be serious people, not gossipers or flatterers, not over drinkers, not greedy. They they don't have to be able to teach, but they have to have a true hearted faith in gospel doctrine. And unlike overseers, a deacon may be a man or a woman. Notice verse 11. Women likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Now, you might have noticed, if you have an ESV Bible, that I have opted for the alternate translation at the beginning of verse 11. The reason that I've done so is that the Greek word here is not the word for wife, but the word for woman, for the obvious reason that Paul is not talking about wives of deacons, but about women deacons. The ESV is making a translation judgment based heavily on a tradition of interpretation. And in the interest of full disclosure, they've told us so in the footnote. (laughs) And that's one of the reasons that I trust the ESV so much. If there's a question of translation, they tell us so. But we are justified in using their more literal alternate translation for at least three reasons. I'll give them to you quickly. First, the translation women likewise is a literal translation of the original Greek text. The possessive pronoun there, T-H-E-I-R, is not in the Greek text at all. Second, the reading women likewise is in keeping with the logic of the text. How strange it would be for Paul to address only the wives of deacons while leaving out the wives of elders, especially given the emphasis placed on the hospitality of elders, which would certainly have included their wives. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, whereas we have very little evidence for the existence of women elders in the early church, we have Surefire evidence of women deacons in the early church. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, Paul, who wrote the letter of 1 Timothy, also writes this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Sincrea. Now, given the fact that Phoebe is a deacon of the church at Sincrea, it's clear that Paul is using the word deacon here in its official sense. 
So for these reasons and others, the office of the diaconate is open to qualified women and men. In the case of male deacons, as with elders, the management of their households is the litmus test for their fitness for the office. In the case of female deacons, um, they are, everyone is being tested. Everyone's life is being considered. The general rule of thumb for elders and deacons is that they are not called to do something that they're not, in some sense, already doing. Now, what do we make of these standards of office for elders and deacons? It would be easy to hear all of this about qualifications and begin to feel like a second-rate person, as if there were two tiers of people in the church. I remember hearing the late John Stott, the British preacher, say that he never left the pulpit without at least a partial sense of failure. And I have to tell you that I never walk away from this passage without at least a partial sense of failure. But that's not why these lists are in the Bible. The thread that ties all of this together is the word household. Notice especially verses 14 and 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God. Now these standards are not here to demoralize us. These standards for elders and deacons are here to ensure that God's household, the church, remains the safest place on planet earth for people to meet Jesus Christ. Elders and deacons Ensure that an environment of safety is maintained where weary people can find rest and all those who mourn can be comforted and the smoldering wick of faith can be reignited by Jesus Christ and that all who sin can find a savior. And I'm so pleased to say that our pastors and elders and deacons are just the kind of leaders who do that. I finished recently a wonderful book that you might have heard of called The Boys in the Boat. Uh, I suppose it's one of the best biographies I've ever read. It follows uh, the Olympic uh, rowers of the 1936 Olympics, some boys from Washington, and we have uh, many of their journals today, so we not only know what they achieved, we know what they thought as they were achieving it. And it was so striking to see that all eight of the boys in the boat, at some point or another, thought something like this. What am I doing here? I don't deserve to be in the boat with these caliber of men. And then this thought, man, I don't want to let them down. I know that feeling. I feel it every time I show up to an elders and deacons meeting, every time I get together with the pastors, every time I stand in front of you and preach. Who am I? And I really don't want to let you down. Now I know that that same feeling is in many of your hearts. And what I want to say to you is, just deeply receive it. If God has put it in your heart to love and to serve his church, you're never gonna feel worthy of the task. But if he's calling you to it, you dare not refuse it. And if you do, you'll miss out on the greatest privilege of your life. Don't miss out on it. Wouldn't it be magnificent if Emmanuel Nashville suddenly quadrupled in church leaders? So much so that word began to get out in this city that Emmanuel Nashville was the kind of place where you could receive the ministry safely where there was space to rethink your life 
and that you'd be cared for in doing so. Let's pray to that end. Our Father in heaven, we long for the real Jesus to be made non-ignorable, and we dare not trust to any other means than the one that you have chosen, your plan A, the church. And so we pray, Father, that among us, you would raise up elders and deacons after your own heart. We thank you for the elders and deacons that you've given and for all that they're giving on our behalf. And Father, we pray that we would, in our day, that we would live to see a great renewal of your church so that it's easy to stumble into a safe church where you can meet Jesus. Would you do this great work speedily? And may our eyes see it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.